it will always be difficult for outsiders to break into that space. And we've seen many more tech-oriented funds that started investing in biotech very quickly left the field again because they felt it was actually something which went beyond the realm of their expertise. So yeah. I would welcome it if more money was spent on that type of research because it's for the health of all of us and all of our populations, it's significantly more important to bring a new drug to market compared to having another hotel booking app. Today, I'm speaking with Martin Emanuel Bittner. Martin is the CEO and co-founder of Arcturus, a biotech platform company that's driven by robotics and machine learning. Arcturus is primarily focused on accelerating the drug discovery process and has been working on this since 2018. Martin was priorly at Oxford, where he got his PhD in ecology and started his company. Among other things, we discuss how the drug development process has evolved throughout the last decade, what industry and academia can learn from each other, and the ways in which biotech has largely differed from tech so far. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy our conversation. So Martin, thanks so much for being here today. Brilliant, my pleasure. So first of all, um, at Arcturus, could you just briefly introduce um, what high level problem your work is trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Of course, very happy to. So in brief, kind of Arcturus is a company which is based between the US and the UK. And our approach is to accelerate drug discovery. And the way we do that is by providing the highest possible data quality to researchers in biotech companies and pharma companies and academic centers. Because the realization that we've made is that everything in drug discovery is a series of decision-making steps. You choose a target, a hit molecule, lead compound, and so on and so forth. And all of these decisions have to be based on some form of data. But right now, this data is being generated and curated manually, which takes a very long time. So to anyone who spent time in a wet lab, it really does take very long hours to generate data. And still, even after a week or after a month, you can only look at a very small data set. And in our case, we use robotics to help us run these experiments at scale and with 24 hours, 24 seven operation. And with that, we can then help researchers spend more time actually thinking through their research topic, their research idea, and giving the experimental execution to us. So we can then provide the data for them. And what do you, was the most interesting idea that initially got you hooked on working, what you're working on now? Hmm. So the initial, the starting point for the company was that I did my PhD. And when I started doing my PhD, I was very surprised to see how researchers spent their time because I always had this rather romantic image in my mind that researchers would think a new idea, read a scientific paper, develop a concept for a new experiment as opposed to spending hours and hours and hours doing manual cell culture, manual Western blotting, manual PCR. So that was the starting point to think about, is this really the way scientists and researchers should spend their time, or is there a better way? And at the same time, when we look all around us, we can see how our industries are being transformed by the use of technology, robotics, the cloud, machine learning. All of these things have a significant impact on our lives. And I felt that there was a very real opportunity to bring the same principles and the same technologies into a drug discovery context. And at the same time, I met my co-founder. Then together we said, this is something we're both passionate about, something where we believe there is a very real, very real chance that we can build something actually meaningful and lasting. And so we started thinking about robotics, about data science, and then bringing together both the team and the technology. And so far, what has running Arcturus made you change your mind about? Have you like encountered any limits? Uh, for example, of, like applying just as an example, like robotics to to like drug discovery, um, where you expected it to work a lot better than it actually did, or like even running teams. Um, is there anything that comes to mind? Just what do you do differently? What do you wish you would have known? Well, I mean, the past five years have been a very very steep learning curve. Because neither medical school, which is originally, nor kind of going through a PhD, teaches you anything about 
running a business, building a company, hiring people, recruitment strategy, technological roadmaps, fundraising, sales and business development. So all of these things you have to teach, teach kind of yourself and with the help of mentors, board members, advisors. So I've learned an enormous breadth of different skills. And all of that is extremely enriching because when you go through kind of the process of building a company, it really is a high intensity environment where you can learn a lot of new skills in a very short amount of time. Of course, you then look back and you think, oh, I would have done certain things differently. But that is kind of one of the one of the wonderful things of building something truly you, truly new and truly unique in that you know that some of the mistakes you will make simply have to happen because you're doing something no one has done before and that makes it okay. Yeah, like about the technical, um, like the, the company itself and like the contents of what you're trying to do, um, have there been interesting like limits that you kind of like stumbled into? Like, is there anything that's kind of left unresolved for now where like progress in the field as a whole maybe has to happen or like the different fields that you're kind of taking in, like whether it's data science or like robotics, uh, for you to be able to kind of like advance. Mm, absolutely. I mean, the good thing is that overall drug discovery technology has been evolving a lot throughout the past three to five years in particular. Many AI companies, I mean, most AI drug discovery companies are between five years and 10 years old, and they've made significant advances in many ways. At the same time, laboratory automation has also seen a renaissance in many ways and has been climbing enough to new heights in terms of technological capabilities. When I do take a step back and I think about what are the things we really should be doing better and we need to work on more, it's about finding model systems which are more relevant and more physiologically relevant and more reflective of actual human biology. Because we know that, for example, two-dimensional cell culture, whilst being an extremely useful model system for some applications, also is very limiting because our cells in our bodies, they don't grow in 2D, they don't grow in plastic, and they don't grow in incubators, but they grow kind of in a living, breathing organism, which is a three-dimensional structure with blood vessels and organs and so on. So in other words, thinking about how can we do more research on more relevant model systems is one of our guiding thoughts. We try to approach that problem by, for example, automating organoid work, spheroid work, co-culture models, iPSC-derived derived cells, etc. So in other words, it is already something which we're doing as much as we can. But mm -hmm. I believe that over the next five years with technologies like organ on chip, we're going to see kind of an even greater increase in trying to recapitulate more human biology in a Petri dish. And I think that's going to be a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... On the content somewhere, um, what are the myths about automation that you feel like are actually like the most pernicious for understanding the field accurately? Mm, you mean kind of some myths that should be busted? Yes. Mm. So I think the myth kind of number one, which we always encounter, even by people who spend a lot of time in the space, or maybe even particularly by people who spend a lot of time in the space, is that automation or robotics is the same as high throughput screening. It's one of those thoughts because pharma companies have invested a lot of money and effort into building high throughput screening solutions, which very heavily leverage robotics to screen, for example, a million compounds against a given target. And that is definitely kind of one use case for automation for robotics, but it's not the only one. And that is why we always try to say that automation as a technology can be applied far more broadly and brings benefits which go beyond brute force. Thanks to automation, you can run essays in a highly consistent way where the same experiment run today, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, can be recapitulated in a way that you know, irrespective of who the researcher is, it will be the same experiment done the same way and you can actually pull that data, compare the data and work with that data as opposed to saying, oh well, this experiment was done by Jim. Jim always does it slightly differently than Joe. And suddenly kind of with two different experimental readouts, you don't know which one to trust. So that is kind of one of the most important benefits of automation is that data consistency, improved data capture. And it's something which we always, always kind of try to highlight for us as a company and for the entire field, that we have to think about using tools more broadly 
and really making use of the benefits they provide us with. Yeah, yeah. Is there something to be said for like a loss of flexibility if it's all like automated in the same way? Or is that kind of like, actually, we don't want any flexibility, we don't want any nuance in like how researchers can use those tools because we actually just try to have like similar kind of similarly run mm. experiments across the board. Mm. Very, very good point. And I think enough, that would be actually be kind of myth myth number two, which is that that automation precludes flexibility. And that is something we spend a lot of time thinking through. How can we ensure that even in an automated fashion, we can still allow researchers to make very small modifications or very big modifications from experiment to experiment, from run to run, but doing so in a deliberate manner as opposed to doing so simply because an experiment protocol wasn't written up pro properly or because two scientists interpret the same protocol differently. So in other words, we're very much aware that being able to control experimental conditions and being able to vary them is absolutely crucial for high quality science. And that is one of the reasons why in our case, we can automate experiments down to a single plate. It can be a single plate with a single cell line we can change every single parameter we want to, but it will still be run on the automated system yeah. as opposed to saying that, mm, oh, well, for that type of experiment, just doing it manually kind of quickly, because then you lose out on all the benefits that automation can provide once you think about it in a flexible, modular way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you wish maybe more people on the outside realized about your field, like beyond and just like the myths that are getting busted? Like, is there anything that you actually could impart um, on those I'd say? So I would say in general, drug discovery genuinely is a very difficult industry to be in. Drug discovery takes 10 to 12 years to 10 to 12 years to bring a new drug from idea to market. It's an expensive enterprise. And it's not because everyone in the industry kind of is is being deliberately trying to do things slowly, but instead it really is genuinely a hard problem. How do you think about developing a new drug for an organism like a human body, which is incredibly complex? We have so many interplays between, for example, just between our, our organs, our immune system, circulation, metabolism. It really is something where we have to think very carefully which of the many, many kind of levers do we want to try and pull and try to modify? <clears throat> and therefore, kind of, I think having a lot of respect for the people who dedicate their life to drug discovery, I think is always a very healthy, very kind of healthy kind of first assumption to make. And from then on, we can then think, how can we improve processes? Because the way, the reason why we move from in vitro experiments with cells to then having in vivo studies to then moving to clinical trials is because it would be far too risky to just go from idea directly to, to patients, which is why we first try to de-risk our assumptions, we try to de-risk our approach. Also because we've learned in the past with stories like, for example, thalidomide, that we have to be incredibly careful with what we actually give to our patients. And therefore, there are very, very good reasons why things take their time. But as an industry, it's always good when we think about what can we do to improve things mm -hmm. yeah and within drug discovery right now um where are people scared to go like what are people scared to work on what are maybe like underexplored regions that's of the scientific landscape mm. so i think there's a few reasons there so one is everything which is better researched overall will most likely have a low risk profile or at least will appear to have a low risk profile and given that we already deal with a very small chance of overall success, people will try to maximize that in any way they can, which oftentimes means working on something where you know 10 of your fellow fellow peers, be it companies or professors or researchers, already have been in that space, so it might appear like the safer bet. Another reason is also commercial considerations, because we know that sadly, for example, work on antibiotics, while from a public health perspective being extremely important, is something where the financial reward structure is sadly, sadly kind of in a way that for a company, it doesn't make any sense to invest in antibiotics discovery. Yeah. So is there like any particular like problem that nobody's working on right now that seems central to you 
but it's kind of like not fitting into that incentive structure. Mm. So I think in general, kind of anti-infectives, so antibiotics kind of would be kind of the number one, the number one field to mention, because we know that we only have a limited number of antibiotics available to us at the moment. There have been no new antibiotics entering the pipeline in a very long time, but because of the spread of antibiotic resistance, we know that we need these new treatments. So what some some researchers are very scared of is this potential future of the post antibiotic age, where we're busy going back to the world the way it was in the 1910s or 1920s or up till then, when just kind of having a very simple accident where you have a small cut, a small wound can already become lethal when we don't have antibiotics to treat any emerging infection. What is closely related to that is neglected diseases, especially tropical diseases where we simply do not have the same market power, which is why there's far more people working on Alzheimer's drug than on something which would treat bilosiosis or would treat, um, or for example, a vaccine against malaria. And on the kind of antibiotic resistance, um, how far, if, if there's like any kind of like quantitative measure that would indicate like how far we are away from like uh, hitting that kind of wall um do you do you have any estimates on where we are like how fast we would have to progress to actually find viable alternatives mm. so we're definitely kind of seeing a spread of many multi-drug resistant or extensive drug resistant strains when it comes to for example tuberculosis where for the longest time while treatment takes a long time, it has a very high overall success rate. Now we're seeing that also in Western countries, Europe, US, we're seeing an increasing proportion of patients who enter hospital with either the so-called MDR, XDR type, type kind of tuberculosis, which then makes it very, very difficult to treat. So the problem is the problem is definitely kind of on the rise. There's very good data for that. When it comes to novel ways to treating them, so I know that recently one or two new antibiotics focused companies have actually received funding. So we always hope there's a new antibiotic which will come out of it. The only, the only problem is that we know that these new antibiotics would be used as reserve antibiotics in, mm. for the most part. So only everything else fails, which is when we mm. then use these drugs. That also explains why the financial incentive structure is so poor because this means revenue will be extremely low. And therefore, yeah. I know that some organizations from the European Union are thinking about potentially setting up a fund, which would then mm. give companies a guaranteed form of revenue, even mm. though the drug isn't given to anyone. So there's a lot, a lot kind of influx there, but definitely another topic which deserves attention. Yeah, yeah. Have you been exposed to better, I suppose, like incentive structures or like funding structures that actually kind of forego the most pernicious aspects of like traditional, like, I don't know, like it's probably mostly VC funding for startups that are actually trying to, trying to fund biopharma. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So it's kind of one of the things where you have to take a bit of a meta perspective and think what are the things we could do to improve the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. In many ways, kind of we have these different players where academic centers do basic research, they might find a new target mechanism, they might find a new, a new approach, which might be worth exploiting. And it's traditionally been biotech companies who would then bring that, for example, up to phase one, phase two clinical trials, at which point is sufficiently de-risked and sufficiently close to commercialization, the large pharma company might want to come in, either buy the company outright, or license a particularly promising compound. But I think especially throughout the past 12 to 18 months, We've seen that funding for new biotech companies has either come to a halt and or has been reduced significantly. So one of the big worries is that we're actually going to see kind of a decline in new innovation being commercialized because there is significantly less funding available. And so I think looking for alternatives is, is paramount. But I also know that sadly, because drug discovery is such a complex ecosystem with so many different aspects that need to be balanced before you can commit to doing a certain program or doing a certain drug discovery, taking a certain drug discovery path, it will always be difficult for outsiders to break into that space. And we've seen many more tech-oriented funds that started investing in biotech very quickly left the field again because they felt it was actually something which went beyond 
the realm of the expertise. So yeah. I would welcome it if more money was spent on that type of research, because it's for the health of all of us and all of our populations, it's significantly more important to bring a new drug to market compared to having another hotel booking app. But it is something right. where we have to hope find more better ways. Mm, yeah. Why do you think a lot of VC funds um, aren't that rigorous when it comes to kind of biopharma, if that's like a fair way to put it in the first place? Like, why are they kind of like going in and then like suddenly budging again and like going to maybe being ironic, but like funding another SaaS company? Um, why is there like a lack of, I guess, like rigorous, rigorous funds in your, your experience? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't necessarily call it kind of lack of rigor. So I would say kind of there's there's one or two things you need to dissect. So one of them is it's a VC's job to make money. So if something gives them a 10x return, something else gives them a 3x return, it's their natural choice to go for the 10x return. And that is a very, very natural choice to make, and no one is to blame for that. At the same time, a trend we've seen throughout the past few years is that so many opportunities in pure tech became extremely expensive to invest in with very high valuations, which meant that with very high valuations, the potential for a return when it comes to an IPO is going to diminish. And at that point, investors have to think about, are there other asset classes I haven't looked at so far, which I might want to invest in? And suddenly kind of biotech appeared like this untapped territory where overall valuations are considerably lower compared to tech companies, which seemed like an opportunity to make a very nice bargain and therefore kind of to create kind of a good return. But that was the thing when then suddenly the realization then hits throughout late 21, early 22, that biotech is significantly harder to do compared to pure technology development. Because once you have a product within tech, once your app has users, starts creating revenue, the question is, can you do it profitably or not? And can you scale it or not? In biotech, up until your phase three data, so up until a few months before you apply for approval, so to speak, you would always have a risk that your drug might not work. And mm. on the way, there are many different aspects to consider. Your patient population, for example, reimbursement strategies, changes in healthcare policy. There are so many things to look at, which in a traditional tech sector might simply not have the same, not have the same prominence. Mm -hmm. And it seems like for you, um... In your background, your work also entails interacting with both the private sector and academia. Um, I always like this to ask this question: um, What are like some common misunderstandings of the two factions that that they have of each other? Like, what do you wish each side would realize about the other's role? Mm, it's a very good question. So, I mean, I spent a few years kind of in a pure academic context, and now kind of the startup context. So, some of the things that so first of all, I think the most important realization that both sides have to have is the role in this together. No one can do this on their own. Academia without biotech commercializing their ideas, but also biotech without the groundbreaking work of academics wouldn't work. We all need each other. That's kind of bringing up the number one, number one realization to have. Mm -hmm. Then it comes down to some of the, some of the misconceptions that I think some people in in either sector might have. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people in in biotech tend to forget that academia really is a space where you have extremely, extremely high pressure, where you have to have to publish novel findings, where you have to find ways to get funding for your research. And for where every one or two years, very similar to a startup as well, you might kind of lose your entire research progress, research group, and so on and so forth. So I think understanding that academia is definitely not kind of the not the not the cushy kind of choice. That is, I think, a very important thing to always bear in mind. While at the same time, I think in academia, kind of there's oftentimes the thoughts that it's a company which equals they have money. But the truth is, many startups, many biotech companies don't have as much money as it might appear because that is being spent on staff, lab infrastructure on legal expenses, et cetera. It's genuinely kind of extremely expensive to build and run a company. And it doesn't mean kind of that a company can suddenly spend spend a lot on, for example, academic collaborations. So having kind of this mutual understanding for life, both as an academic and in a company 
is hard and comes with pressures and that money has to be earned before it can be spent, I think that would already go a long way. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what have you become more skeptical about in the past, like say a few years? Um, on the other side, what have you become maybe more convinced of? Hmm. So I think in general, kind of one always, when one starts kind of a new company, you would always assume that with a new and an improved concept or an idea, that change would be imminent or change would happen very rapidly. And one of the things you realize is that to build a great company and a great product and to really kind of change an industry, it takes time. We've now been building the company for five years and we're seeing significant growth, especially from last year to this year, now looking forward, it's been accelerating tremendously. But that's not just because we're doing an amazing job in our company, obviously, but it's also because around us, we're seeing the industry change. And that's one of these key realizations I've also had that right timing is incredibly important. Five years ago, when I talked to people about automating drug discovery research, most people would just shrug and would say, well, well why would I? Everything we do is, is okay the way it is. Now, five years later, having seen how AI can transform our industry, but having also experienced the lack of high quality data to build and train and validate these models, the entire industry is significantly, has significantly changed its stance on the need for automation, the need for robotics, the need for rigorous quality standards and data. So we're seeing the entire industry is now looks completely different compared to five years ago. And that changes something which was delivered by many, many different companies, many different researchers, many different organizations, all pushing in the same in the same direction. So in some ways, the realization you can't change an industry on your own, you have to have your peers, but also on the plus side, once the change happens, it will be profound and it will lead to a better industry for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And between you and the people you work with, what's the most maybe contentious issue that repeats itself when you're debating that you work? Like, what do you share as like a main disagreement? You mean within the company or with other parties? Yes. Um, well, actually, both would be interesting. Um, but adjust it however you want, like whether it's like people like stakeholders outside mm -hmm. or whether it's like people you work with. So I think of in any organization, there's always kind of a natural, natural kind of tension between exploration, exploitation, kind of how much we want to explore new technologies, new ways of doing things as opposed to perfecting and further scaling what we already have. And I think that is a very, very good conversation to be had on a very regular basis, because you always want to make sure you keep pushing the boundaries when it comes to incorporating new ideas and new ways of doing things, but at the same time, bearing in mind that what you already do is something which deserves to be scaled and to be brought enough to, to more and more companies out there. And I think in conversation with other companies is oftentimes the question of, in a, in a similar similar kind of vein, how much do you want to do kind of the same types of essays that everyone is already doing, such as your standard 2D cell culture? And how much can you already push in terms of incorporating new and some of these more physiologically relevant model systems, knowing that they will be more expensive, but they will pay off in terms of better insights and higher confidence when then picking a molecule based on that data. But yeah. creating the shared understanding, that doing more early on, investing more in discovery will pay off when it comes to the clinical stage. And that is kind of also a shift in understanding where people need to be convinced. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, I guess last question, because um, I know we're running out of time. Um, what's like a piece of implicit knowledge in your field that you feel holds true generally, but it's not really explicitly stated. Like what has to be learned in you by people entering your field uh, with no real reason, it could be written down or like shared more publicly, but for some reason, like it's just not done. Mm. So I think interestingly, kind of most people will do a PhD in, for example, be kind of oncology or be in cell biology, but there's not really kind of, in, there are not really any PhDs in drug discovery per se. Mm -hmm. So the actual yeah. art of drug discovery, which phases it entails 
why we follow in a specific way what it means to work in drug discovery. That is something you actually only learn when you speak with practitioners. People who spent and dedicated their careers to working in biotech or pharma, they'll be able to tell you so much about the space, the field, how to approach it. Of course, you might search for a, for a textbook, but it really doesn't bring it to life in the same way that kind of speaking with a practitioner does. Also kind of the ups and downs, why certain things might create excitement, but then kind of just lead to a disappointment. Also knowing why certain programs that are scientifically perfectly, perfectly sound. So your textbook would say it's a dream program. In reality, it would get axed. And why? Because of strategic consideration when it comes to, for example, market sizing or a company deciding to divest from a certain indication area. So being able to integrate these very different pieces of information is something which only comes when you spend a certain amount of time in the field, but it also makes it very exciting. Yeah. Do you see like any particular, I guess like people or companies or even like research departments, like um, trying to make that like, you know, absent drug discovery PhD knowledge um, more broadly available? Mm, so I've definitely enough seen an uptick and I've been very interesting articles in, for example, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, Nature Biotechnology, that look at certain key aspects of the drug discovery, drug discovery journey. So there was a very interesting paper end of last year on, on predictive validity, thinking about, well, what do we actually need to do so that we can improve which part of the drug discovery journey should we focus on, which molecule should we progress, and what impact can it have, even when we do a seemingly minor improvement in one small dial and suddenly can have significant kind of following effects. So I think there's definitely kind of a push to institutionalize kind of more, so to bring more of that knowledge into a tangible form, make it accessible to kind of entire institutions. And that is something which I'm very positive about. Lovely. Um, are there any important questions or like themes um, that you wish we would have touched upon? Is, is there anything left unsaid in that brief amount of time? I think there's going to be enough kind of potential for another kind of half an hour, an hour kind of, of chatting about right. the, the industry. <laughs> Given kind of how important kind of health and kind of drug discovery is kind of for all of us. So I think one thing which will certainly be, be looked upon kind of in many of your future episodes mm -hmm. is the role kind of that new and emerging technology, technologies as in modalities can play. So looking at not only into small molecule drug discovery, but also antibodies, peptides, sRNA, so then gene therapy, there are kind of so many treatment approaches in general, which I believe are going to already play an important role, but will probably play an even more important role moving forward, be it as tools or be it as direct treatments. All right. Um, thank you so much, Martin, for taking the time. This was really interesting. Likewise. Thanks, Leah.